Uh, welcome everyone to the second episode of AI Insights, uh, which is a series created by the European Center of Excellence in Exascale Computing, Research on AI and Simulation-Based Engineering at Exascale, or in short, CUE RACE. I'm the coordinator. My name is Andreas Lintermann. Uh, I'm from the Uli Supercomputing Center, and in AI Insights, we are aiming at shedding some light on the research that we are performing in the Center of Excellence. And uh, last time in the first episode, which uh, should be uh, linked here, uh, we were already having a guest from the RWTH Aachen University, Fabian Hübenthal, who was uh, explaining some of the research he's performing in this project. And today uh, is with me a new guest. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Morris Riedel. He's a professor from the University of Iceland. So welcome, Morris. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Okay, so maybe uh, I already mentioned you are a professor at the University of Iceland, but that's not your only position. Uh, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit, introduce uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, what is your background? Where do you come from? And how did you get to this position in Iceland? Yeah, okay. Yeah, very interesting question. So I think first is to say that um, I'm 20 years at the Uli Supercomputing Center in Germany. So that's where it all started quite a long time ago. Uh, interesting times at that time, um, when you think about the scales we're talking about in HPC today. Um, and of course, it's nice to look back 20 years, but uh, basically I'm also 10 years now here, a professor at the University of Iceland. And as Jülich is a national lab, that was a quite good opportunity um, to basically move to Iceland to team up with a national lab and then with a professorship so that we have a good flow of students from the national lab using the big HPC machines. While on the other hand, we have nice talent here and opportunities then to give PhD degrees. And of course, the life quality in Iceland is also quite nice, I have to say. So this was quite tempting also with the responsibilities here. So um, of course, um, here are not so many HPC professors, um, I, I may say, so I guess I'm the only one in the country. And then, of course, this goes with some responsibilities, being your HPC JU governing board member as well, uh, talking with the ministry about priorities in that area. So it's a nice, interesting collaboration. I'm still in Jülich part time. So we have, I mean, joint students together, me and you and many others. I think we are around 15 in the research group now, which is a joint endeavor of Jülich and Iceland. And fun along the way, like next week, we have a PhD retreat in a very nice location. I think the PhD students looking forward to it, the postdocs looking forward to it, and myself as well. So it's a shame that you couldn't come, Andreas. Yeah, I, I would have liked to, but uh, we will meet after summer again, I guess. Um, when we have our all hands meeting also in Iceland, I'm really looking forward. That's to that. right. Yeah, so, indeed. So are you most most of the time you are in in Iceland doing teaching, uh, or are you also uh, more often in 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 Jülich in Germany, or uh, how do you do that? I guess you travel ar around a lot. You were mentioning also Euro HPC. Uh, um, maybe you can explain a little bit uh, um, to the to the audience what that is. Of course, well. sure. Now, basically, now I'm fully based in Iceland, um, specifically in COVID, as we have been all grounded. We took the whole family here, basically, so I'm grounded here. And every now and then, of course, come back to Jülich. But as we know, many of the things can be done remotely. The students that we have jointly are partly here in two offices, partly in Jülich in offices, and they go and travel a lot back and forth. They have to stay here a little bit of course, for some courses here and there, and also to see their universities, the ones from Germany. And then also, of course, for those that are sitting here, it's very nice to see the big machines we have in Jülich uh, and also the colleagues that are over there. So when I talked about EuroHPC, of course, this was something which is maybe still new for some of us in the HPC community. We had the Praise uh, Consortium, which was basically then really over a long period of time existing, the Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe, a multinational endeavor to really harmonize and really promote the activities of HPC. Um, they also were quite important in the peer review process of who gets access to these machines, because HPC machines are costly and should be used wisely. In that endeavor, basically, we saw more and more the professionalism, right? I come from a time where praise was not existing. So we had DASA at that time. 
And, and then over the course of praise, you saw the HPC community becoming really mature. More and more countries were interested in joining planning strategic objectives, what we can do in HPC. Um, needless to say, more vendors came along. Um, then the, the episodes of GPUs started suddenly, right? Uh, it came also from a time where no GPUs were existing. So it was also interesting. But uh, long story short, um, the Euro HPC endeavor was then formed to really put that, I think, on the next level, really um, with having a kind of the commission as 50% involved and then the national um, countries that signed up to the Euro, uh, Euro HPC JU uh, declaration and regulation. And basically, this is now something which is um, a bit more formally, I would say. Of course, it was a praise council. Um, there was money on the table from the commission for projects, but now let's say many of the, these activities include a much more strategic thinking. So it's a multi-annual strategic plan. Um, it includes also more activism on the, let's say policy levels from within the commission um, reaching to EU council decisions of activating money, which is important for us researchers, right? Also to see how we can basically protect the money that it flows really to HPC as we know there are many other important factors. Um, you know, fishing, tourism is an example here in Iceland, right? Which are also very powerful industry, not mentioning the film industry. So we also have to ensure on higher levels that really money is coming to the HPC research projects as we want it. So in this sense, uh, your HPC JU is really um, situated in Luxembourg. It has a team uh, which is also expanding. I think that explains why the startup was a bit slow. They had little people, little manpower in the beginning, but now we really see more and more people who have been started there, lots of activism. We are basically in lots of contact. And the good news is also some of them are recruited from our own. So a good colleague from Sweden recently joined the team of the JU. And I think that's good to say that this is not just a political endeavor, right? So there are people that understand HPC um, that are basically then on the other side on the funding uh, authority in the funding organizations, which can make a difference in my opinion. So of course, praise was good and is good still. We are in the process of transforming praise towards more user engagement and, and user communities. So it's not that praise is gone, but the role of peer review is basically shifted more and more to the JU and the experts there. And of course, uh, it's still, let's, let's say uh, in the baby steps perhaps, but uh, we see more and more impact there. And it's a glad to serve on the governing board with my colleagues in that context. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. So that is, uh, it's not about only, uh, let's say, support for the user community, uh, for the HPC users. It's uh, also about software development for, um, for, for the HPC machine so that you have really software that uh, there is funding for projects that bring software to the next generation of supercomputers. But it's also about hardware, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. So I think it's, it's basically this multi-annual strategic plan is, has different categories where we think already towards the next couple of years in advance, what calls should be there. And as you rightly say, some of them are for HPC really machines. So hardware, um, where we basically looked, of course, in petascale performance, we have now around, I would say, six, seven uh, your HPC machines, but um, interesting and nice is, of course, that we also uh, have now the funding for an uh, exascale machine and Jupiter, which will be situated in Jülich basically in the next year, hopefully 2024. And uh, this is a done deal and shows also how this strategically works because co funding this from the German government and co funding this from the union. Um, all of this needs to be properly planned. And of course, there will be more systems on the way. A second exascale system is planned. Um, I cannot reveal who might be interested in that, but it shows that the strategic thinking of giving resources to people, researchers, but also more or less nowadays industry and SMEs is an important factor because we have seen in the long time, <clears throat> this is probably also something where the JU is now a little bit different. It pushes really the industry uptake of HPC that we need to really sustain uh, the funding flow, the sustainability of machines in the long run, and also the software you mentioned. Many of these are of course research projects after two, three years. And then the question is when we have done all this good work, 
uh, what happens, right? Of course, then maybe associations need to be built with industry partnerships uh, where basically then this could be all much more sustainable. So in this sense, the calls also look on a quite research and but also with an interesting view on the industry along the way. So where can we help industry to get on board? We have the national competence centers helping there a lot. Um, on the other end of the scale, we maybe say we have the center of excellences that help basically several codes to really do that step. Because as we know, and our researchers know that listen, at least it's not so easy to just throw a code on a HPC machine and it will automatically scale towards exascale. So that's not correct and it takes some time to really go there but all these considerations are of course a, a very good thing and uh, one can expect that the, the toughest thing in this is a budget right so you could always say we could do much more much more center of excellences because there are so many codes around that should scale and fill Jupiter in one respect and then you can say well there's so many companies out there especially what I would say with my background in AI uh, especially in the AI domain, we could do much more with companies, but then also there you have budget limitations. How big should the framework programs for this be? And the calls for that be? Then you want to align the supercomputers in a federation, which is important because you want to exchange data, maybe harmonize access with Jupyter notebooks. There are lots of questions and lots of categories, which in when you are part of these discussions, it's all important, right? So there is hard to say, um, where we put the money. And I think with this, it's good to have the governing board also um, with their infrac and react, basically two, um, let's say, groups which give input also to the JU, also to the governing board in order to find the best solution. Okay, I see. You, you were mentioning now uh, AI. I would be interested, and maybe also the audience as well, uh, what's uh, what's the role of AI in research at the moment in Europe and how do you see it progressing in the future and what is required from a hardware perspective and maybe also from a funding perspective? Oh, many, many questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say, um, and I could talk an hour about it. Um, yeah. I think we see the role of AI in everywhere in the media these days, right? I think chat GPT is, is basically uh, not only here in the university, a very frequent topic because students have started to activate this tool. Assignments and is I think in the media well represented. The question is if it's really well understood by everyone, right? I think one of the, the kind of limitations I see also for the adoption of AI is healthcare, right? Where people are still scared, oh, AI, I don't want to have a medical doctor that is a machine, um, which is often also not the goal. It's decision support system to inform the doctor, to make his life easier, to save time for doctors. And then they use this to take the effective decision themselves still. But to, to get this along the way, um, I think this is something where still needs work to be done. On the technical side, I think we could do much more. I think there are not so much limitations anymore. We see the Euro HPC systems and the other European systems having more and more GPUs, which are an important factor. So this graphical processing units, which actually get more and more optimized with tensor cores, for instance, uh, to solve the AI training problem uh, very quickly. And what we do, of course, with HPC is we use not one of these devices, the accelerator. We basically use several software packages that we then uh, combine with the use of many hundreds of GPUs to speed up the training, right? So this is, I think, where HPC plays a very big role, where in former times people have used GPU workstations and they're running all night and may have perhaps over several days. Um, and, and now basically with HPC, we can scale up and solve this problem in a couple of minutes. And then, of course, the second role is the better AI models, right? When we think about hyperparameter optimization, uh, it's a very important topic where almost all AI researchers can benefit from. So better models by using better parameters in AI, uh, training algorithms, what we also can uh, nicely support with different trials of parameter setups, smart algorithms from HPC to make this kind of not only the training speed up better, but also have better AI models in the end, not only faster training. Okay, so just for my understanding is, so you have some kind of AI model that you want to train and you want to maybe do this in parallel and you want to uh, it to be, uh, to get one AI model with the best performance and the training should be as fast as possible. 
yeah with a mm -hmm. maximum amount of training data maybe so you would have different uh let's say knobs uh or buttons you can push and turn to steer the behavior of the training and these are mm -hmm. the hyperparameters that you then use yeah it could be the i don't know the number of layers in a deep neural network or the i don't know the the steps size, uh, things yeah. like that so mm -hmm. and then, then you you mentioned this uh, hyperparameter optimization yeah so that means you optimize these knobs yeah you try to find the best uh, configuration such that you in the end uh, reach uh, the highest accuracy uh, best performing models uh, in the shortest amount of time right that's absolutely correct yes so okay. that's how you can see it <laughs> Okay, and there was another thing that you were mentioning, the, the so-called national competence centers. Maybe, maybe you can also talk a little bit about this. I know that you're also sure. involved uh, in, in uh, the so-called URCC project. Maybe you can explain a little bit to the audience what that is. Sure, with pleasure. So the national competence centers is one of the instruments, if you want, from the um, EuroHPC joint undertaking and the you know, membership countries basically to have an entity in each of the different countries, EA and EU, to really deal with, let's say, um, the competencies in the countries, to understand where we have the experts. Um, it's basically a team of around four to even much more people. It depends uh, from country to country, but there's a harmonious way of collecting information, who is using HPC and how you can be basically onboarding users to HPC because many of the countries are maybe not advanced as their neighbors. So many of them have more groundwork to do to maybe establish um, ways of, of getting to HPC machines. Um, and this is some part of this competences work that the NCCs have. The other one I was already mentioning is more thinking about industry, especially now in the EuroCC2 project, which is the next phase of the NCCs, which is I think a very good endeavor because it's all about trust, especially in industry. So they want an entity to collaborate perhaps more longer with a long breath and don't want to see it disappearing. So a research project in a way would be not so ideal in that sense. So that's why the national competence centers are here to stay for two. Now we have plus three years and hopefully uh, you know, another period after them. And they deal with, again, the idea of connecting then the different organizations that have this specific interest, let's say, CFD problems, computational fluid dynamics, some modeling um, of wind wheels. Um, an example in Iceland, what we work with are vertical wind wheels, for instance. And then, of course, we try to combine these ice wind company, for instance, then with expert here in the country with CFD, and then basically see how we can model these devices. Because before now, they do it in 3D printing, right? And then in, in, in small chambers where they try to basically design the models. And of course we can do this in HPC. And this is a groundwork what NCCs are doing at large. Of course, with this goes along consulting, training, um, how to use a HPC machine, what means AI, you know, distributed training for speed up your modeling, what means hyperparameter optimization uh, for a small startup. These are all topics which are not normal. And also I think have several challenges we, probably also have to talk about. It's not that all these different components and modules on the supercomputer are easily usable. We are also, of course, the NCCs come partly in this, again, trainings, perhaps workshops more now as COVID ended, uh, to really also then see how we can align our strengths across the national boundaries, right? So what can we learn? We have very good relationships to NCC Germany. We have NCC Sweden, for instance, where we also um, have lots of interactions and learn a lot, basically how we do that here in Iceland. Uh, we in Iceland adopt, for instance, a strategy of simulation and data labs that we basically learn from the Uli Supercomputing Center from NCC Germany to structure all the competencies in the countries. And this is by far now much more successful than having just one mailing list somewhere as it was before the case. Right now we have the dedicated labs on our national competence um, website and everybody can directly see its natural language processing. Ah, chat GPT, large language models, there's the expert for it, a colleague Hafstein, basically just next door, but it's visible. It's visible to all the NCCs in the other countries so that we have quite an expertise, which in turn was actually leading to another EU proposal, right? So that was informing others that then contacting us 
and we all did another you know eu grant for llm for large language models oh, um in basically so these are i think activities where nccs are quite important needless to say in the future we basically do also much more with coes um, through a mechanism called castile which is then sort of bundling the energy from all the nccs and harmonizing that information okay that would be uh, actually my next question what role the, the coes <laughs> could, uh, pl uh, could play in uh, in this context yeah so um, because I know uh, as the coordinator here of this project, I know it's all, always a little bit difficult to uh, to connect the cutting edge research that we do uh, here uh, in the center of excellence using uh, large scale resources to connect this to the to the national competence uh, competence centers or to industry. Yeah, but actually then the, the NCCs, they could play a quite good role, I believe, in uh, making this connection. Yeah, and mm -hmm. showing maybe the, also the industry uh, what is what is possible with the resources we have, what is possible with the knowledge we have, and what is developed on a, another scale in research, right? Yes, so I think they're very complementary. So I think the instrument of CUE scale, before a little bit towards the region of saying we want to fill Jupiter in 2024, we've got to be prepared for this, right? To have the exascale applications really working. And, and this is something what the NCCs are not really um, as a main goal doing. They would say they would identify users that potentially in all the countries could make use of that from these specific codes, because many of these codes which are scaling up might be reused in some industrial use case. But there is a way where you have to do the baby steps first before you come to the exascale. And I think there is the complementary steps where the NCCs can do the groundwork, uh, can basically get prepare users to when you really want to go that far and have interest in that and use of that, maybe it's good to do first use cases, testimonial success stories on a smaller HPC machine that is available. And of course, we from the NCCs know where you can apply. We help you there, how to do a grant to get computational time. And once that is successful, then maybe it's good and the time that a COE comes into the game and then we can use a code for that. So I think it's a good example of these different instruments, I think, that we try to aim to achieve in the Euro HPC JU uh, working programs, which, as I said, of course, is not always easy. There's budget limitations along the way. Uh, many interests of many countries, not forgetting this. But um, I think that would be a good vehicle also for the future, that very specific elements in the CUEs and to really find interest in this from industry mostly but then also maybe here and there, the academics, government organization, even perhaps uh, think about scaling up um, avalanches, right? Is a huge topic here in Iceland, uh, societal relevant, which is something where I think much more modeling can be done. But I think st still there, avalanches and so on have to be modeled and have been modeled a little bit by Veda Stovan and collaborators in, in a rather smaller scale. And to do the step then up to the really high scale, exascale, will take some time for all the researchers, which are not expert necessarily in HPC, right? They basically have their expertise somewhere uh, to understand the avalanches impact in the environment. So this is something where this teamwork uh, which we have in the NCCs with domain scientists and HPC experts could lead them to a good collaboration of COEs. In some of the countries, of course, there are already some of these experts. So there, of course, the NCCs could directly channel, I think, and this is already happening, that some of the COEs are collaborating. Like I think our NCC, for instance, is quite involved in AI because we scale up quite significantly. Uh, for instance, one PhD that just finished, you see the thesis in the back uh, just last week, basically Rocco here, he is uh, really someone who can scale AI up and using that with remote sensing applications. So, and this is something where I think country by country have some experts that already are ready to scale up in higher endeavors. Okay, I see. So that means industry should really be informed now that there is availability of compute resources mm -hmm. and there are people around that know how to use these resources efficiently. Yeah, and there is also efficient and scalable code around that people could use. They just have to grab the opportunity, so to say. Exactly. And I think then getting to all these users is something what the CUE is, of course, partly have also as their task, but on a bigger scale across whole Europe, it makes sense to leverage the NCC system, right? With all the countries to 
to delegate this in the system. And I think that's one of the ideas in the future that it gets much more known through the channels of Castiel, which play a little bit the promote organization, so to speak, which comes from the COEs to the NCCs, but also the vice versa, where we can inform the COEs where potentially users of their code is. And of course, with this, the NCCs could also play maybe their fundamental role of identifying those organizations that maybe even help in sustaining some mm -hmm. of these codes, because if they have large industrial use cases using that codes, potentially are that they may be also interested in, in maintaining the code belong the, beyond the lifetime of the CEO itself, or um, let's say forming an association together with academic partners to do basically much more than maybe could be done just this now research grants. Of course, the COEs are also meant to stay. I think they will be evaluated once Jupiter is there. So how, in, how it really works the instrument, are people really scaling up to a whole Jupiter, for instance, an exascale? This is something what we still have to see and we will learn, I guess, in the future. And then, of course, there will be probably more CUEs coming if that really works as instrument. Okay, that means really that um, people from different domains need to work together to solve problems. Yeah, so that you really, uh, like you were mentioning, uh, um, that you really like, like maybe need AI people and HPC people to help people in industry Yeah, that never have maybe used an HPC system or are not mm -hmm. aware what AI can do for them. This is also something that we're doing in the COE race. Here we're also connecting domain scientists with AI scientists, with HPC scientists. Maybe you could say something uh, a little bit about that because I know this is happening a lot in Work Package 2. Yeah, maybe you can explain a little bit how we do this. How do, do we bring the people on the same level that they speak the same language? Yeah, that's not so easy. That's right. So <laughs> in race, we have the good fortune to have really lots of domain scientists on board that use basically... Um, on a daily basis, HPC systems already and computational fluid dynamics, for instance, but also data intensive use cases, CERN is on board with large hadron collider data, but also smaller use cases um, with sound engineering, uh, where we're talking about having a personalized ear experience or remote sensing, so Earth observation data, where it's plenty. So all these domain scientists uh, basically have their requirements for different types of AI, intertwining models with physics with AI, or basically have huge data sets to really scale up and use AI with those. And the way how we work in Work Package 2, which is then forming a so-called AI framework, can we harmonize the setup? Can we make it easier for domain scientists, right, to use these systems effectively without getting lost in all the details? is basically one of the goals of Work Package 2. And we have several mechanisms there, um, something called the interaction room, where we have a very huge canvas, which we do regularly, and where we have the problem canvas, the data canvas, then a little bit about the model, AI model canvas, and then the architecture, which should be not forgotten. So the architecture in a way of which are the concrete HPC systems where this is all running on, and what libraries are needed, what tools are needed to make it happen. And this, of course, takes time in the beginning to get speak the same language, to understand what we do in AI, that it's sometimes also limited in scaling uh, here and there in terms of batch sizes. So lots of small details where you say, AI isn't that just throwing an algorithm on data at work, work automatically. That's not the case either, uh, as well as with CFD, just throwing you know, an open foam on a mountain here to do an avalanche that's not working. So it requires a lot of work as well. And I think the understanding of these communities, which have been traditionally disjunct a little bit, right? So we mm -hmm. would say HPC, when I think back of my 20 years, we always were thinking about numerical methods based on known physical laws. Um, there was not much AI in the past, right? So, and then suddenly in the next, perhaps five to 10 years, this becomes more and more and is now of course, maybe getting a, a really peak usage in the large leverage models, where I think this would be another case for exascale, right? What's coming up there with foundational models that can be there on the HPC machines for enabling a much more specialized model that we see now in ChatGPT and so on. But essentially, this is a, a very important endeavor. And by communicating in this interaction room, uh, which is actually also a research part here from a good colleague of mine, Professor Matthias Bok at the University of Iceland, where we basically try to understand what are the common requirements of all these different use cases. Can we 
Uh, how we can simplify this by forming this basically unique AI framework, unique in a sense, so that we can say we have the concrete models and everything ready so uh, that you know it will exactly work on this HPC machine. So it's not that people still have to search a lot and do their own elements. Okay, I, I know that the, the this unique AI framework is like uh, central to the whole project because it collects all the different components that is being that are being developed in the project and contributes to a to a whole story. Maybe you can um, shed some light on the uh, on some details of this uh, unique AI framework. What is what's the mm -hmm. content of this? You were already mentioning these different AI models, but there's more to it, right? Indeed, indeed. I mean. If you want, the, the motivation of all that started um, when we did the grand approach of, of getting to the CRA's project a little bit with frustrating situation, as it should be as a researcher, right? You think about what frustrates you every day and what frustrated me was at that time. And I know that since Yuli, since quite a longer time, um, that people always exchanging job scripts via email or they're sending, hey, do you have the last version that worked on this particular systems with these particular modules and libraries at that time. And then this guy sends it around and then there are three other PhDs taking it up, using it on another machine, it doesn't work. Well, yeah, it's not really so easy to port to another HPC machine or we basically are involved in training. So me and my deputy of my research group, Gabriel Cavallaro, who is also now a professor actually here at the University of Eisen as well, still remaining at Jülich, we had lots of trainings where we prepared everything wisely on Friday and then the training on Monday begins and it doesn't work again. So because it changes somewhere in the module that happens suddenly and this tends to change a lot of things. So one example is Python, right? One Python version change could affect many different modules that you have to load. Um, and this could be meaning your job script that you need for batch submission for the HPC machine will suddenly not work anymore. And then you start, what is now the correct one? And I would say, and in, in my experience, around two to three days per month, PhD students do nothing else on this. So Maureen, and then Maureen, of course, I would, they're frustrated. Sorry to interrupt. I would like to go a step back because you mentioned yeah. how many terms that maybe our audience does not understand. So right, like, of course. <laughs> uh, something like a job, job script, uh, Python modules. Uh, so could you maybe explain this a little bit so that they, they understand? Sure. What, because it's not easy to run a, a, a training, an AI training on an HPC system because it's a, really a system of many, consisting of many CPUs or GPUs, yeah, so, uh, mm -hmm. the normal computers or graphics processing units. And somehow you have to make uh, efficient use of these resources and you have to share the resources with others, right? Indeed, indeed. Now, let us start by the Google Collab experience, right? When we talk to AI researchers, for example, they think Google Collab in the cloud, that's all you need for HPC. But then you have just one TPU, one GPU available, it does a training. So this experience is a little bit different when you then approach to real HPC systems, when you really want to scale up, want to use multiple GPUs in parallel to really make it faster. So in this sense, um, there we have the, the point that often these systems can be um, used by so what something called job you know, scheduler. We have a Slurm, for instance, which is quite known on many of these systems, where you then schedule with many other users to have your application performed at some point in time. And this is what we refer to as a job script. We have to prepare this job script, give it to the scheduler, and then you are done and will be computed. And of course, you have to wait for it in the schedule, depending on your need. Now, when you have this job script, it's also not something which is very, very quickly generated. One of the challenges is, of course, setting the right number of GPUs you require, the right number of CPUs, maybe for CPU applications. But then, of course, the wall time, how long you think will be your job running, there's sort of general information in it. But the, the crucial elements I was talking about in my frustration before, if you want, is really the different versions uh, that exists, right? And then having also low level dependencies with Nickel, for instance, for NVIDIA libraries, very low level, while on the other hand, users actually use TensorFlow for AI training them um, or PyTorch for training the AI model. So they have to have these modules and these software available on the HPC machines in order to do the training. 
-hmm. And that's where basically then in the batch system uh, script, the modules come in. The modules are environments which have been already nicely prepared by the administrators. So my frustration goes also not against them because basically it's hell of a lot of software around there. Um, it's more rather the frustration that the right combination of all of these is needed. And it's always different on all the different HPC machines, right? Some, uh, some of them is now even extreme. If you think about Lumi with AMD GPUs and then our systems in Jülich, which have NVIDIA GPUs. So different heterogeneous hardware, different vendors, and we see this exploding in the future. So even more frustration maybe is on the horizon with all the different vendors coming, more opportunities, but also more complexity. Okay. And so that, we're targeting and, exactly the complexity of the job script. Okay, so that means CUE Race has developed a solution for that? That's what we basically have. And uh, we call that the unique AI framework where we believe that we have found a good solution where we can harmonize some of these information into a repository where we do automated testing if these module setups are still working, right? So we would have a right combination of several of these modules already available that can be then put in a batch script. Um, some of them call that also job script generator. Um, that will be a website um, where you basically see which modules you can put in your batch script. This would be still required because AI researchers know uh, you still have to do the last bits. Where is the data? What is now the concrete TensorFlow um, Python code you want to run, which is the AI model you effectively train, a convolutional neural network, long short term memory, auto encoder, whatever it is. But the software requirements for it to make TensorFlow running in the different versions, you still TensorFlow too. And all of these are basically requiring different other libraries and stages, as we will call it, uh, in the different supercomputers, which is then the next factor. You have computational time on one and another one and another one. So you tend to have to port. And in the future, even much more than in the past, because you get more and more your HPC, JU systems, which will be probably from the technology side here and there even more heterogeneous. We heard about the EPI, the European Process Initiative, which also will provide us hardware in the future. We have this modular supercomputing where different modules are existing. And that's where CU Race comes in and has a solution called the LAMIC API, which is in the heart in basically this uh, unique AI framework. It stands for lo load modules, environments, and containers where basically containers is then another uh, form where we want to also to simplify the usage. And with this solution in RACE, uh, we already have talked to many national competence centers that really like the idea. Um, we have talked to many users which really require it because they don't want to spend time on it. A remote sensing researcher, a healthcare researcher want to have time on the AI modeling, want to have time on their domain problem, not spending time on finding out what is the right module solution to have TensorFlow running on one of these HPC machines, especially when I get time grants on different machines. This multiplies the effort. On the other end of the scale, I should say, because CUE race means CUE, Center of Excellence, that means scaling is another important factor of us. So we have really activities in the project which are quite interesting to really check which of those components, TensorFlow, combined with Horowat for scaling up, really. And we proved that this works with benchmarks. We showed where are the limitations and batch sizes. PyTorch, DDP, the same way. So we have really analyzed this. And there are many, many frameworks around these days for AI, but not, not all of them scale. And this was part of the idea also of the AI framework to say, this is a stem we give. You can use these tools. We have shown that they at least scale on the beta scale, on the extra scale, we have to see still, of course, right? We need systems for this existing, but we already have good views that this is gonna work. And this will be basically combined also then with the efforts of the NCCs reaching hopefully to more and more users. And what we will see hopefully as an open source endeavor in the future where people contribute with job scripts that we regenerate them with the job script generator so that people don't have to frustrate it be any more longer and that basically this emails of job scripts here and there uh, chaotically and then changing things on the fly between PhD students, PIs and so on will hopefully end and we have a proper repository 
that is shared across the whole member states, basically, and in, in, in DEA countries, so that we there have hopefully also input from even the hosting sites. The hosting sites um, have good, good, good collaboration with the NCCs, and then the center of excellence. So that this could be a quite a really nice um, idea, also for the sustainability, of course. But we are still, let's say, at the first version, so we have to also see how the user community is reacting to this, of course. Okay, uh, I know you also have brought a, a, sh a short video on this, a, a short demonstration. Maybe we can we can show this now. But uh, how easy it is to to use this Lamech API actually on uh, I think this was done on a Yiddish system. And maybe we could also talk a little bit about um, experimental systems. Yeah, so you were talking about scaling, testing things out, different software, but there's mm -hmm. also new systems coming up with maybe experimental hardware. And I know that uh, the uh, race is also um, uh, looking at cases on a quantum annealer. Yeah, it sounds very interesting, a very new topic. And uh, maybe you can say something about that. Yeah, sure, with pleasure. So um, it's actually one of the strengths companies of Iceland combined with Jülich, of course. So in, in the NCC network, uh, just yesterday, there was actually a student speaking, Amer, um, basically here in Iceland at the university as a public talk about using quantum annealing and the quantum annealer for optimization in AI, in remote sensing, and colleagues from NCC Sweden participated. So we see there's quite, um, I think, a momentum in this quantum computing ongoing. The way how it works, I think, simply speaking, you would say, is to really use um, quantum these days as a specific accelerator. So we don't talk about general purpose, as you would say, like, the CPUs that we have in the modular supercomputing approach, for instance, in the cluster module with high single thread performance CPUs, or the booster that has then lots of many core um, you know, GPUs inside. So alongside these modules, you would say might be another module, which is then this quantum computing module, solving specific tasks. And what is interesting for us is AI researchers could be uh, basically uh, using this device for optimization problems. And because every researcher in AI knows, in a way, many of the AI algorithms inherently are optimization problems, right? So in this sense, how you can see it maybe from the 10,000 feet perspective, you would still require your general purpose computing, but when it comes into the AI algorithm part where the optimization is needed, a quantum device, like for instance, a quantum annealer we use, um, might be good to just solve that problem and then coming back and to the general purpose area. And when you want to see it from the 10,000 feet perspective, uh, when you do normally optimization on a device like a GPU or on a CPU, you would always go to something we call stochastic gradient descent, finding the minimum of error of basically a parameter setup, um, while then the quantum device would basically put water over it, right? It would be, and, and this is a fun story, a realistic story, I have to say, uh, just for our users, where there were questions about the computing time of quantum ones in a very important meeting, where we had lots of time on GPUs and CPUs and just a couple of hours, I think it was on a quantum device. And then they were saying, oh my God, you don't have any time on quantum. So <laughs> what, 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 how, how would you do this all quantum ideas that you want to do? And I think there it's important to understand and where also the benefit is that, of course, the optimization is solved in this, right? So it's absolutely exactly. quick. Yeah. It's not what the AI algorithms do now with optimizing, going down the arrow slope, uh, finding the right learning rate for doing this, uh, using interesting aspects like Adam optimizer momentum and so on. There, we, as I said, with the water analogy is, of course, much more complex than that. But if you want, they just put water over it and there where the ponds are, Maybe there are three or four points. Still, the question is where the absolute minimum is. But you get a much, much faster um, optimization output that you then, of course, can use and tune again. And important is to understand really that the computational time that goes into this is extremely short with a blink of an eye. So that means Raze is really developing uh, specific software is benchmarking code that is available, um, thus develop new AI models on, uh, on 
production systems that are around in uh, in Europe, but also on experimental systems. And all these things, they flow together with the requirements from the different applications that we have into this un unique AI framework. And I think you also brought a slide on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Here, coming in. <laughs> yeah. And um, this basically shows uh, everything, yeah? So you really have the software components, the hardware components, the use cases, you have the NCCs that are connected. So basically everything that you already talked about. Yeah, there may be one exception, which I think is incredibly important also in the light of the fact that we had recently um, the good fortune to talk with our colleagues from the European Commission for the AI network of excellences. So that those that are not really deep in HPC, right, really hardcore AI users. And, and they had requirements to HPC, which is also, I think, important for us in CRAs to listen to. And, and that's why I think we have been invited with the European Commission to talk with those uh, on a very, let's say, interesting level of saying also complaints where our HPC systems have still lacks or what software should be installed. And I think while we talked about what's batch script, this is already quite hard exercise. And just putting a Jupyter notebook there on the HPC machine will also not do the work. You need to have kernels specifically modified to use Horobot at scale at the different systems. If you just have an interactive notebook, uh, then it doesn't help the AI researchers as well that much. So I think there we see lots of elements and we talk about the foundational models of the large language models, transfer learning possibilities where now probably lots of the EU systems in the future will have the same data sets again and again copied with different users, spaces, using hell a lot of storage, while this could be simplified, uh, I think, side by side. Uh, these are topics where I think we also discuss, of course, in, in the infra cafe about how we can sim sim simplify the usage for AI researchers. And the one thing that is that you also see on the element here with the open ML community and also the clear ML. ML ops is an incredible important factor there as well. I didn't talk much about that, but you see that the AI community with a Jupyter notebook, that's one thing, but many of those are also implying these techniques where they really track the different runs over time, use this ML ops approach, um, which is also of course adopted in many companies. And I think this is also something where um, AI research at large needs to improve where we want to help. We have an ML ops server in race for you to be used. It's actually open and available, just contact us. Where also maybe researchers and also of course people from industry can a bit more streamline the AI activities. Many of those do directory, this is my Python run, I then, then I submit it, put somewhere a text file that was the accuracy output. Now I modify my code and then I submit it again. So all of this tracking of the different parameters used, the outcomes, the accuracies, um, can be a bit more harmonized by this ML ops. And with this, hopefully also prevent, let's say sometimes a chaotic, I would say usage of HPC by AI researchers, uh, just throwing always different job scripts with different AI codes on it, while the ML ops really is a good tool there. Also, this is not extremely easy. We have to make their training. We did a training in the past, and I think we will do another training on this at some point in time with some success stories. But this is just another example when you ask now, which of the EuroHPC hosting sites offers an ML ops server? I would say you get almost a zero answer, right? So yeah. uh, another reason where we see the AI community is completely different oriented and we have to really adjust us a little bit and the framework can help to find these elements to really engage in communities which are already existing. The OpenML community is another interesting one with having experimental runs shared code, shared data. Uh, and I think that's where we're going to, where basically don't waste storage by having again and again the same models everywhere, share it properly and wisely once, and then others can make use of it. I think these are important topics as well, like the Jupyter kernels, um, to make it, of course, much more easier, not always writing the job scripts. Maybe in the future, we can you know, hide this from AI researchers completely. I see this absolutely makes sense. Most we slowly have to come to an end before, but before we really end, uh, uh, I noticed you are involved in many projects. Yeah, you're in CU Race, where you lead the work package too. Uh, you are in the URCC project, and, and I know there are many more other projects uh, that you are involved in. And uh, in the EuroHPC governing board, uh, you are a member. So 
Uh, how do you relax? Yeah, I, I don't know. There must be very uh, a lot of stress to work in these different projects. Uh, do you have a team supporting you? Do you ha have help? And uh, how do you relax? How, what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> yeah, very, very right. It's lots of activities. But I think one message to take away is really I'm doing it since 20 years. And I really love my field, right? I think otherwise it would be also not possible. We really have to do this as professor, but then it's also important to trust people. Uh, recently, I hired an assistant because it's getting more and more work and this is running, I think, better and better. It takes some time to get into the system of an assistant, right, when you're not used to it. Um, but then, of course, I have to say postdocs are incredibly valuable along the way in my research group, which is around 515 members now. We have two, three postdocs. And actually, as I mentioned, my deputy of the group, Gabriel Cavallaro, for instance, uh, was very important also in my success, where we basically could work together. And uh, uh, where he now also becomes a professor, where we see the whole model works quite nicely, where I can also trust and delegate a lot of activities, co-supervision of all these students here and there in a specific domain of remote sensing. So I think this is an important factor as well to really, um, you know, delegate and, and really work a lot with people uh, it is sometimes interesting um, to, to agree on a common modus operandi, but I think uh, this was incredible along the way. And then the most important fact is, I think, what Richard Branson would say, right? It's like uh, work hard and play hard. I would combine this more rather than work hard. I mean, that's clear. We all have to do this. Everybody is full of tasks, but I run hard. So I'm actually a quite passionate runner. 10 kilometers just basically, uh, I think, two days ago. You have to take time for it. So even if they are pressing emails, urgent emails from a coordinator called Andreas Lintermann sometimes, I take my one hour running and I think it's important to think still about the health, right? Here and there are push-ups along the way, a bit sport, finding time for family. We played uh, Settlers of Catan just recently, although I had a very big deliverable in the URCC coming there. And I know there was a big roadmap to ride for Iceland in the next three years. And so again, big responsibilities, but um, to have sustained superior performance with all these tasks, with all the activities, it's, I think, very good every now and then to just, you know, step one step back, take time for sports. And what I didn't mention, which is of probably the one of the nice living qualities here in Iceland are the hot pots. I often go just before I go to bed in a hot pot with 44 degrees. I sleep quite nicely there afterwards. So it's another good example how you balance, I think, the huge, tremendous work, uh, not mentioning traveling, reading books, as you can see in my shelf, right? I'm actually reading a hell of a lot of books. I still try to find time for that every now and then. So it works on travel. It works when I'm in a summer house. It works along the way. Of course, there are lots of papers to read, but every now and then having also a, a book about several other management topics, maybe where we as researchers always have to advance, maybe <laughs> um, is something also I read. Uh, and this gives me also some clearance of mind. That's very good. Actually, Morris, while I'm waiting for your emails, I also do some sports. <laughs> <laughs> very good. So it helps everyone to slow yeah, down. Ab absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, with this, uh, we slowly have to come um, come to an end. It was very interesting talking to you and I could uh, uh, talk to you hours longer. Uh, thank you very much for shedding light on the research that is going on in Work Package 2 specifically, but in also in race in general and uh, what the aims of the project are. Um, so we will con continue with this series. Uh, there is uh, one episode per month we're planning and mm -hmm. the next one will uh, come up then in uh, in the next month. And for everyone else, uh, subscribe to our channel. Thumbs up for, for this video. And thanks again, Morris, for uh, being with us here. All right. Thank you very much. And see you next time. Yeah. See you very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.